Well, hello, Westview Baptist Church. Uh, it is Wednesday, July 1st, 2020, and this is the ongoing saga of the Wednesday night Bible study of Hebrews. I am so glad you are tuning in to, uh, to participate in this. I hope that you have taken a few moments to maybe go back and look through the chapter. We're getting to the, uh, to the uh, end point of, um, of uh, this uh, section uh, in Hebrews. We have another uh, section to go, but uh, it's going to be exciting. And uh, God's really been, uh, I think, giving us opportunities to learn a lot about not only about him, but about our, our relationship with him and our walk with him. So uh, let's uh, pray and we will get right to the text as always. Father, I thank you that we can have this time in your word. I thank you for uh, the uh, resources and the technology and uh, the time, all of it. Father, you have made provision for in advance so that uh, we can uh, have these moments. Father, I pray that we would find ourselves better men and women, uh, better followers of Christ as a result of spending this time in your word. God, give us wisdom, humble us. Lord, uh, let our minds and our hearts be fertile soil for the word, uh, for in which the word can be planted, uh, and then for the word to take root and, and to grow, um, to bear fruit. Lord, we pray that um, we would be able to push aside any distractions or deception or anything else that would be pressing in on us right now that would keep us from being able to, uh, to benefit from what your spirit would teach us. Lord, always we, we uh, say to you and we thank you for being our Savior. We thank you for being our Lord. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, last time we spent a little bit of time thinking about the benefit of firsthand understanding, firsthand uh, interaction with information, with experiences, uh, gaining firsthand knowledge. Uh, today, I want us to think a little bit about personal goals and the, the goals that we have, especially uh, in regards to following Christ in the, in the Christian life. So what are some goals that you have? Maybe, maybe it's to, I don't know, be more consistent in your daily devotional life or to be a prayer warrior in a way that, that maybe you aren't. Maybe you aren't as dedicated to the uh, spiritual discipline of prayer as you would like to be. Uh, or, or maybe a goal for you is to uh, participate in some areas of service or some areas of um, ministry that, that you just haven't tried before, regardless of what those goals are. And, and I do hope that, that you have goals in terms of, I, I want to uh, live as a Christian this way tomorrow and the next day better than I am right now. I hope you do have goals because goals are important, right? Uh, there are really, you know, some, some, I guess, overarching goals that unite us all as Christians. We want to know victory in Jesus. We want to be overcomers in this life. And we should want to be holy. We should want to be uh, living in a state of increasing amounts of holiness. Holiness is, is being set apart for God's purposes. So uh, today, in the, in the couple of verses that we're going to be looking at in Hebrews chapter 12, we'll be touching on... Uh, some, some different themes that center around the goals of the Christian life. So endurance, certainly we'll be thinking about endurance, thinking about uh, uh, relationships in, in, in one regard, and then the next time we study, we'll, we'll think about them in another regard. Be thinking about accountability and be thinking about uh, repentance. So those are just some of the things that are in view. Let, let's get to the text, though. So um, <clears throat> the letter of the Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12, 13, and 14, is what we'll be looking at today. And uh, again, uh, this is this is carrying forward the theme of being in the race and the athletic metaphor that's been used uh, throughout uh, this chapter in the book. So uh, the author says, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness of uh, without which no one will see the Lord. So strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see uh, the Lord. So uh, as I look at these first two verses, 12 and 13, in this section that we're studying this evening, I think about the, the duty to, to self that is in view here. Lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. You can just imagine a coach, you know, from the 
sidelines, uh, yelling this to encourage the runner, you know, just lift those drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and just pick it up and just dig in. This is, this is imagery of uh, certainly a runner in a race. And it's also imagery that's drawn from Isaiah chapter 35. Uh, verses uh, verses three and four in particular. Uh, Isaiah 35, three and four would, would have probably come to mind to the original reader of this, the Hebrew Christians that were that were struggling in their faith. So let me share this passage with you because it's pertinent here. So um, he, uh, Isaiah chapter 35, verse three and verse four says this, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees, right? Sounds familiar. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. So th these are, uh, again, in Isaiah and then uh, carrying that idea uh, forward into Hebrews, what we're studying tonight. It's this encouragement that, that says, you know, be strong, find your strength in the Lord. Don't give up. Uh, there, there's also uh, a bit of a callback here to a verse in Proverbs that uh, is in view. <clears throat> Proverbs 3.11 uh, says, uh, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, right? This instruction uh, from God the Father to his children. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Uh, you can see how uh, the author of uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verses 12, 13, and 14 certainly was thinking about these passages and probably many others when, when this was written. So let's let's get into verse twelve here and see what it's talking about. Because again, there's there's this there is a there's a pastoral exhortation here, like a coach almost, a coach or a pastoral exhortation, a challenge. It says to pick up drooping hands and weak knees, like a marathon runner who's who's at the end and feeling exhaustion. If you've ever run in a race, uh, either uh, by choice or against your will, <laughs> sometimes if you some, some, you think back to gym class in middle school or high school and, and the nightmare that was the, the required uh, health and fitness test that you did every year, running the mile, you know that at the end of that, you're, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're dragging your hands and your knees are weak. Um, the challenge there is to don't give up, right? Dig in and make straight your paths for your feet. What, what's the author getting at there? Well, I think he's saying to us to choose our paths wisely. When we're low on energy and we're, we feel like we're about to give up, it's really important that we are walking that straight and narrow so that we're not wandering off of the path and, and, and wasting energy, wasting effort, wasting resources, uh, and getting into who knows what in terms of uh, damage and deception and distraction. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 26 uh, comes to mind uh, here when, when you think uh, about this uh, challenge. Uh, Proverbs 4, 26 says, ponder the path of your feet, then all of your ways will be sure. So th that, that proverb is telling us to, to be thoughtful about how we're living and where we're going, the path that we're uh, walking on. It's, uh, it's a challenge, as is this verse in verse 13, it's a challenge to live a purposeful life, uh, an intentional life. You say, well, I'm, I'm intentionally trying to, you know, get up in the morning and go to work and pay the bills and, you know, take care of the kids and take care of my family. And those are important things and they're all very important and, and they all have their place in our lives. But the the intentional living that's in view here is is more than just getting through and getting by. It's it's also spiritual growth, spiritual achievement. It's, it's uh, fulfilling God's purposes for our lives, uh, living um, life on the straight and narrow is about bearing fruit in our service of Christ and our living for him. So there's a lot wrapped up in this, in, in these few words here. It says in verse 13, uh, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint. And at first that may sound strange. You think, well, what, what is that, what is that getting at? Like, well, physically areas of weakness, areas of fatigue in our, in our body, right? Uh, they can be subject to more injury. If we're not careful, if we if we have some weak knees, for instance, or, or weak joints, if we're not careful with what we do with those and we don't strengthen them, then uh, they can become further injured, right? Stretch ligaments can become torn ligaments, for instance. Uh, spiritually, what this is speaking to us then is that uh, if we are uh, weak in any area spiritually, we can suffer injury if we don't 
take charge over how we're living and and let God uh, give us coaching, give us guidance back toward health. It, it's interesting that you know the, the the solution to you know physical weakness isn't less activity. It's actually activity that's structured to strengthen the body, right? So if we're lax in spiritual disciplines, if we have waning conviction, if we have waning dedication, well, the answer isn't to just back off of those spiritual pursuits. It's to be diligent and to be thoughtful about um, what we're doing, not to just, for instance, if we're weak in the spiritual discipline of prayer, the answer isn't to just commit to spend every moment of our waking days in prayer. It's to have structure. It's to have periods of prayer, periods of work, periods of sleep, periods of these, there needs to be structure and order in our lives. So the answer isn't, isn't less to, to achieve strength. It's, it's, it, it's oftentimes more, but it's more that is uh, carefully and rightfully applied uh, as God gives direction. So what's in view there? Well, it's healing is what it talks about. So uh, it talks about wanting to be healed so, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. That's, that's the goal in this case. So this is healing by way of activity, right? Unused, again, unused muscles will atrophy. It takes will. It takes effort. It takes choice to flex those spiritual muscles, faith, courage, um, trust in God, uh, gifts that he's given us to serve him. We have to use those lest we get weak and, and just lethargic in them. So the point is this, that this walk through life that we have with our Savior, with Jesus, it requires us to dig in and muster determination, right? It requires us to remember that our strength comes from God, but we have to leverage our will and our faith to uh, to, to to grow, to mature, to finish the race. Let's look at verse 14. So verse 14 looks then uh, beyond our duty to self, but duty then to society, to to be a witness, uh, to be a, a true believer and a true bearer of love, of God's love, uh, so that we can be ambassadors of the gospel. It says in verse 14, to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Striving for peace with everyone. Could there be any more relevant words to... Uh, the Christian life, to the world, to the situation that we find ourselves in today, where so so little of striving for peace with everyone is actually occurring. Um, I find this challenge to be very pertinent uh, to life here and now in Martinsburg, West Virginia in July of 2020. Have you ever considered all the things that threaten peace between people? Like things that, that, that really come uh, to bear that, that arises points of tension between people. When I give a little bit of thought to this, I realized that just two um, are, are necessarily in, worth investigating at this point. And the first is, is differences. So differences uh, between people threaten peace between people. And that can be differences in many different aspects, everything from worldview to culture to political views to life circumstances, context, all kinds of things. Differences between us, oftentimes, if we're not careful, become points of contention, things that that, that tear away at peace, right? Another would be fear. So if we're fearful of others, what they have, what they can do, what we can't do or what we don't have, uh, that can be a, a, a break or a... Um, a preventing factor in peace between people. So you say, well, why, why do we have to think about these things? Well, because Jesus wants us to strive to be at peace with everyone. And I know, and you say, well, how far does that go? You know, because we, we don't, we're not called here to be at peace with, with everyone to the extent that we totally compromise our convictions and back away from what God has called us to do. But, but being at peace with everyone is, it's, well, it's built on a couple, I would say, foundational truths. Uh, one would be that, that everyone is made in God's image and everybody is imbued with him then with, with limited free will and the responsibility and the right to choose what they're going to do with that free will. So I have to acknowledge that other people have that. And I also need to, to see that, that um, people are going to choose differently from me and that I am not, I'm not their judge. 
I, it's not my responsibility nor my ability to be the judge of another human being. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, we have laws, we have, yeah, I'm talking about on an individual basis. I don't go around, um, uh, it's not when Brian speaks and sees wrong and calls wrong, wrong. It's not thus saith the Lord. Uh, it's just, thus saith Brian. God is the ultimate judge. Uh, so you know, we, I, I try my best to, to represent what God's word says and to teach it and preach it. But I'm not the final authority, and, and, and well, neither are you. None of us are. So when we strive to be at peace with everyone, we as Christians have to remember that we are set free from having to be the judge of the world. And we actually would be in error if we did try to be the judge of the world. When we set ourselves up in, in as judges, we make it much more difficult anyway to be at peace with people around us. Now, again, I'm not saying that we just turn a blind eye to all the wrong and and sin, and of course not. We, we have to call injustice injustice. We have to oppose evil. We must oppose evil. And there's a lot of it that needs to be opposed today. But when it comes to matters of subjective things that aren't matters of just clear right and wrong, we have to be willing to, to as the saying goes, live and let live, to, to really be at peace as much as we can with everyone. You say, well, what, what's at stake? Well, people knowing Jesus seeing him, um, experiencing uh, what it means to be holy and set apart for God, to see God's love. Holiness is, I believe here especially, is um, referring to purity that is born of being set apart for God's plan. So holiness in terms of purity that's being, uh, uh, that's, that's born of being set apart for God's plan, meaning that, that we have holiness because God has touched us, he has given us new life, he's working in us, and he says, look, you know, you have capacity to love and serve and sacrifice in ways that you didn't have before because I'm living within you now. And the world needs to see that. It's, it mentions here about being able to see the Lord. So again, God's holiness working in and through his church um, as a testimony to the world. So we need to keep running the race because we have a mission to reach the world. Not only are we wanting to finish the race so that we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant, but we are running the race so that we can hopefully, along the way, invite others to join in the race themselves and experience victory in Christ. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing to look to your left and to your right and to know that you're not alone in this journey. You, you aren't. And um, many, many countless people have gone before you. And uh, we all ran at different paces. I mentioned that last time. We, we run at different paces in the race. Some, sometimes we sprint, sometimes we crawl, sometimes um, sometimes it's it's steady and consistent. I want it to be steady and consistent, but um, some days are harder than others, aren't they? The goal is to keep running. The point is that we need to pe keep running because we have a mission to the world. There's some advice that is often given. I want to bring this in view as I bring this to a close today. And it's advice you've heard before. It's just a saying, essentially, that says, you know, don't start something unless you intend to finish it. You probably had a an authority figure say that to you at some point in your life. Maybe throughout your childhood, that was a mantra in your family. Don't start something unless you intend to finish it. You know, I, I remember thinking as a kid, <clears throat> you know, well, you know, who would start something intentionally beginning to fail? You know, who, what pursuit do we start? You know, thinking, well, I'm going to make sure I fail this good. I'm sure that there are exceptions, but but generally, when we when we start something, uh, we we want to succeed, right? We want to to, to finish. Um, success in following Christ is uh, at a minimum, probably more than just twofold, but it's at a minimum twofold. Um, success in following Christ to most people means attaining heaven, being with God for eternity. Um, and, and he that, that's guaranteed by virtue of what Jesus achieved at Calvary. If we're born again, if we belong to him, then God achieves that. We're going to have that victory. But the second, I guess, way to end well is to, uh, is to fulfill God's plan for our lives. To, uh, and, and this comes through a partnership with God. It's, it comes from our commitment to follow and serve him faithfully, to... Um, uh, to even even when it's not easy, that we dig in and keep running, um, because again we know we're not alone. We know that he's that he is he is empowering us. He he we won't call us to something that he won't um, also equip us to achieve. 
So this pursuit isn't automatic. It's not easy, but it is entirely worth it. It is entirely worth it. Take survey of your life as, as I close this um, time today and, and just think for a few moments about the worthwhile efforts and investments that you're presently engaged in. How is your time being spent? What are you allowing into your head space? What thoughts are you cultivating? What, what emotions are you harboring in your heart? Are they... Are they positive and uplifting, or are you letting fear and worry and anger, hostility? Are you letting things get in there that are distracting you, turning your head in the midst of the race, turning your head to the to the to the right or to the left, such that your eyes are off Jesus? Let me pray for us, and then we'll let the Holy Spirit do the heavy lifting of of um, imparting to us how we're supposed to live in response to uh, to what He's taught. Father, I thank you so much that you are, by, by your Spirit, um, working in these moments to convict our hearts and to encourage and uplift. Father, I pray that we would see ourselves in these verses and that we would see our need to, um, to commit in the race and to be strengthened by your power so that we don't give up. Because there are so much, so much better things to come, so many better things to come. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way it is always relevant and it is always available to us if we would just take the time to get in. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time, church.